Hi, I'm Heidi Brislin, and I am super excited to be sharing this three-part series with you today, um, looking at how we can get inclusion in action with our switch users and getting hundreds of switch hits every day, all day, um, which sounds daunting, but it is definitely doable. So um, here we go. This is the, the title of this week is the ABCs and one, two, threes of switch access. So it's going to be just starting from the beginning and we're going to go all the way to next month. We'll learn about four tools and uh, that you can use um, daily to get hundreds of switch hits. And then um, the last week we'll work on coming up with like some switch access plans um, for our students. All right. A little bit about me. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, top picture is me with my two crazy puppies. I've got Hermie, the Corgi, and Finley, um, whose name should probably be like Pigeon or Seagull or something, because um, he goes after like all types of food. Um, my two adult children, Sean and Molly, who both live on the East Coast, and there's my husband and I um, at the beach, one of our favorite kind of things to do. So um, I things I love to do is um, explore all over the place really. And um, garden, I really got into gardening this year. Um, I do encaustic painting, which is painting with wax, um, reading and always puppy snuggles. And kind of my motto when I'm looking at working with children with complex needs is figuring out how to make the seemed impossible possible for them. So um, that's kind of the perspective I come from. Um, we already did this. Um, okay, learning outcomes for the whole series is describe three types of switches and where you might place them, um, how to use a voice output switch, a spinner, a pouring tool, and a power link to implement lots of activities throughout the school day, um, work together to create a school day switch plan, and um, apply um, the lessons you learn to create a um, collaborative and fun um, lesson that you might go back and use with your students. So, all right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about play. Play and play matters and the research supports play. And so often um, I, I'm seeing more and more like kindergarten teachers going back to adding more of that play to their day, which is really exciting for me. Um, but really what happens is Play is how we develop all of our skills, our motor, our cognitive, our social, you know, muscle strength, um, our speed and agility at doing things. And if we don't get those opportunities to play, those skills don't fully develop. Um, during play, children engage in repetitive motor movements because it's fun, not because it feels like work. And so that's our challenge is um, individuals who work with you know, children with, you know, complex needs is figuring out how to make it fun, not work. Um, for typically developing children, goal-oriented play involves actively using cognitive skills for motor planning and muscle activation, and they can make something very specific and rewarding happen. And the nerve pathways of muscles that are used repeatedly in play show thickened myelin and better endurance. So that's why play is so important. Um, children with um, out disabilities have tons of opportunities for play, but they also operate lots of, um, oops, sorry about that, um, lots of toys that have buttons and switches already. So when we're looking at giving things, our, you know, coming up with switch activities for our switch users, you know, their peers have similar things where they're touching buttons. Your our switch users button might look a little different. Um, again, it develops results in the development of critical skills. Um, you can use it during individual play or small group play. And again, we talked about the skills that um, it really helps development so develop. So I'm gonna, okay. So we're gonna skip this because this was playing yesterday. So these are two videos of, um, a couple of kiddos that um, the tech gremlins are really out to get me um, that we had set up for field day 
and we had used a power link and set up a um, clear kind of vacuum hose on the wall and we're shooting fans through that with the switches. And so it was play that like everybody could do during field day, regardless of your ability. So when we're looking at our students with disabilities, play is equally important for them. Um, they need to have access to toys that are accessible. Um, they need to have lots and lots of opportunities, which is something that is really hard to um, find time in a busy, crazy day. Um, but they want to engage, we want them to engage socially and physically to the best of their abilities and cognitively um, with their family, their peers, providers, and the environment. And switch access opens a world of possibilities for students with physical communication and or sensory disabilities. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the sensory disabilities right here. Um, a big aha moment for me a couple of years ago was um, one of the students that um, one of my teams in Edmonds um, works with is autistic. Many of the students are autistic. Um, this particular child is afraid of getting messy, like at all. And so he would not do any type of arts or crafts or anything. And we had set up a um, switch pouring tool and we were making acrylic pours. And so the first time we painted, <coughs> I had to set him up probably 20, I used like every switch extender out that we had. Um, and he was about 20 feet away from the easel he was pouring on. And he activated the switch um, and poured it. And he's like, oh, that's pretty cool. A um, couple months later, when we did the next art project, he was right there next to it. Um, so it made painting and art and activities for him feel more safe and comfortable, which increased his participation. Not at someone I would typically have be a switch user, um, but some of those students, it's a great way to kind of get them into the activity um, is give them the option to use the switch and know that they don't have to get messy at all. All right, so switch access equals opportunities. And so this is one of the, um, the OTs I work with. And so what we've got here over on the left is a board that the um, parents made and we've tied a, uh, taped a onto the remote control car that's switch accessible and he's able to go and paint. Before, I'll show you this, this is a short little clip. <laughs> So what happened is in the class, they were coloring something and the OT's like, gosh, how can I get him to color? And she's like, I'm gonna tape something to Spider-Man and we're gonna do like Spider-Man painting. Um, he was probably the most popular kid in the class doing his Spider-Man painting. Learning switch skills requires a lot of hard work. It's not easy. And if you think of any of our typically developing children, learning a new motor skill is a lot of hard work. And because they do it in play, um, or for all sorts of parent appreciation, like when they're learning to, to walk, <clears throat> it doesn't seem like work to them, it just happens. So it requires extensive and repeated practice. So one time a week in the OT's office is, is not gonna be enough to really develop those switch skills. It needs to happen across environments all day long. Um, it must be engaging and varied with immediate feedback. So that means that I was guilty of it, You're sending the same two switch toys to the classroom and everybody's like, oh, he's just not interested in doing that. Um, or he doesn't know cause and effect. First, where in reality, he was really bored. I had um, not created an engaging, engaging activity that I'd added enough variation with variety. Um, when you're learning to use switches, the cognitive load is very high for the student. They're having to do a lot of things at once. They're learning access methods. They're developing motor automaticity. They're juggling social and cognitive components and they're making choices. So we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, um, whatever the switch is making happen, um, that when the student activates the switch, it's worth their while, that it's really worth their time and energy because look at all this that they're having to do. So it should be fun and engaging. Any questions so far? 
All right. So what I tell teams is you want to start with the finish in mind. So in schools, a lot of times we're like, okay, we've got this student for like first grade. We're working on the first grade year. We've got them for second. We're working on the second grade year. And our students with complex bodies really need a long-term vision of what we want them to be able to do with their switches. So we want to start with where we want to see them be when they leave. 18 or, 20, or 22 now. Um, so, boy, this slide got funny too. So, you know, we're looking at this, the end is we're looking at, I'm going to have to fix this slide for you. Really what we're looking at is participation. So there's the activity, the body structure, and really what we want is participation. So hop in the chat. Um, some ways that some some things that might be like your end, what you want the student to be able to do with switches. So we're just getting started, but what is our five, 10 year dream for them? Go ahead and pop some of those things in the chat. All right. Right. While you're thinking, let's partner assisted scanning. Yes, and that's important for so many things, for writing, communicating. Um, Brooke, that's awesome. So really what we want your student to be able to do is, you know, so important. So we've got some other things, leisure activities, communication to engage in work and leisure activities. Yes, and so I've added up here human connection, age respectful play and leisure, being able to access their AAC. Um, many of our students, I know eye gaze is being used quite a bit, but for some of our students, eye gaze isn't always going to be the ticket. And so they may need to be able to use partner, use um, switch scanning um, to access the computer. Um, if we're looking at um, them being a, pow a power mobility with alternative access, switches allow them to be um, interdependently mobile. Um, let's see, Kara has to engage in work and leisure. Catherine has to communicate wants and needs. Yes, that's really important. Um, Michelle has to feel included and able to communicate effectively. And Dory got it environmental control. So we wanted to be able to operate their phone, their social media, their academics, control their environment, vocational skills, and advocate for themselves. So I think you guys got a lot of these. Um, so yeah, so really um, switch access is really important. And these are the things you have to be thinking about. This is where we're going. And it's going to be baby steps through the course of their time with us at school to develop those skills. But when they leave us, this is really what we want them to be able to do. Um, the other thing that's important is we go in with our why and what we want to accomplish and what we want to happen for the student, but sometimes their why is different than ours. And so if you look at like the functions of communication, um, you know, these are things that for some, it may not be a why, but for some of them, it may be that they want to make requests. They want to refuse or reject where people can understand them. Um, they want to be able to make comments, um, express emotional and physical states, gain attention, label things, ask and answer questions you know, to learn more and be part of a conversation, to greet friends and family. Um, one of my favorites is I want them to be able to direct others and boss other people around um, because that gives them some interdependence. Um, I'm going to use the word interdependence because I don't think any of us are totally independent. We are all interdependent on each other to make things happen. And our students with complex needs tend to be more, you know, interdependent um, than a lot of people. But with that, they need to be able to direct their caregivers and tell them, you know, how they've been taken care of to be able to share information, whether it's how you're feeling, um, something's wrong, a great experience that you had, that someone is not treating you respectfully or, um, you know, appropriately. Um, and then to just be able to be involved in relationships, because we all want you know, to be involved in relationships. That's so, such an important part of the human um, connection. So 
what I want you to do is pick a communication function that you don't typically work on. And what would you like to learn how to increase participation with using switches? Or, and then, and based on what you currently have, um, currently know, is there an activity that you would adapt? Does that make sense? So you're gonna pick, pick a communication function back here on this slide um, that you don't typically work on, um, especially with your students with complex needs. And for some of us who are not speech therapists, um, that's something to think about because we're always, you know, as I'm an OT and as an OT, we're always working on, you know, I mean, we all work on communication. It's, it's an essential occupation. It's important for access to, you know, community, healthcare, um, leisure, all of those things. So, um, so pick a function and then based on what you know, is there an activity you'd like to adapt? And we'll see if, by the end of the series, we've got that sorted out for you. So we give you a, a minute or so, because we definitely don't want our students feeling like um, our Star Wars character here. My communication has been ignored. Tanya has function directing others, activity playing games with peers. Yep. Um, starting and stopping music to engage with others. Okay, perfect. Anybody else? I'll bring them. Um, I'll share them when I get them. So this is something that just is really um, kind of where it just, when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is what we do for a living. You know, it's like the limitations live only on our minds, but if we use our imaginations, our possibilities become limitless. So I tell the um teams that I work with is I want you to, I, I'm like, I do not, I believe that there's, you can go into a gen ed classroom and, or a special ed classroom and look at what all the other peers are doing. And you can somehow modify that activity so that the student can um, use it, can, can participate with switches, whether it's bossing people around or making comments, um, making a choice, but there's a way we can get them authentically engaged in that activity. It just takes um, our imagination and just being like, how am I gonna make this happen? So we've got directing others again, um, asking for help with hygiene and comfort, choosing a library book, consistent yes and no. Um, yeah, I love those. So teaching switch access gives children power. So what happens is if we just do things for them, um, they never get that sense of, I have control over my body. I have control over what I want. Um, and it's such a powerful thing for students to learn that. So this picture, what's happening in here is they were doing um, gingerbread houses. And typically in the classroom, what would happen is, um, the para would do the gingerbread house for him. And he might have some choices, he might not. He might have a very nice looking gingerbread house. Um, so how um, my friend Mackenzie here has adapted this, and um, this is um, our friend Jake's little helper, is she has put like the different candies that could go on the gingerbread house. Um, she just kind of drew shapes on the spinner and wrote what they were. Um, cause with one side of the spinner, it has like a dry erase function. And so you can just quickly, um, put something on there. It doesn't have to be pretty cause you're going to tell, you're, you're going to let the student know where it landed. And so he picked all of the items that went on his house. And then he has a couple of switches. He's got one that is no. And then he has another one up here that you can't see that is his yes switch. And so he... Mackenzie would ask him where he wanted it and she'd point and stuff. And so he'd give us a yes and no with his voice output switches um, about where to put them. And so he totally was in control of designing um, this gingerbread house. And it was just so much fun for everybody. All right. So again, gives them that power. So we're going to Teaching skills gives them power. So how are we going to create opportunities to practice two to 400 times a day to build those thousands of opportunities that they need to learn a new skill? Sounds pretty daunting. 
it is possible and it's possible without a lot of crazy work. So just trust me, we'll get there. Um, so again, we're going to add repetition with variety. So we might have, um, two toys in there to switch. I, I like to call them activities and not toys. Cause we're kind of learning things depending on the age of the child. They're certainly for my younger students, their toys, um, <clears throat> repetition with variety. So say I have that Spider-Man car. So Spider-Man might paint, Spider-Man might race. Um, we could put a pencil on Spider-Man and he can draw, he could deliver a note to someone across the room, you know, so Spider-Man is doing lots of different things. And so that's how you think about like, you know, okay, I've got this, you know, my, my district doesn't have very many switch activities, but we have this and this. So how can we add a lot of repetition with variety with these few tools that we have? Um, and the research shows that children master skills faster um, when we add that variety than if it's just the same activity over and over again. Okay, more research. And um, we've got our Buzz Lightyear toy. Um, he's done all sorts of things. He's like colored, he's drawn, he's just walked and talked, he's knocked things over. Um, but what the research says is if you practice a slightly modified version of a task you want to master, you actually learn it faster than if you just keep practicing the same thing multiple times in a row. You know, and if you think about like, you know, if we're doing an exercise program, you know, we kind of shake it up a little bit and kind of do things slightly different. And that's how we, you know, gain that motor memory and that muscle skill and learn how to do a new activity. <clears throat> okay, we're going to talk a little bit about cause and effect because there's a um, couple pedestals I get on and this is one of them is I will sit in a meeting and someone will say, you know, the student doesn't know cause and effect. And I'm like, okay, you know, can they, is there a way that they let you know they're hungry or upset or angry? Like we're born with that cause and effect from the minute we're born, we know, and we quickly learn that if we cry, we will get a reaction. And if we smile, we'll get a reaction. And you know, if we're hurt and we cry or make a sad face, we'll get a reaction. So we're all born with cause and effect. Um, so what you want to do is when you're using a switch, I, I like to call it agency, that we're working on agency. We're teaching them that I've got this really complicated body that does so not do a three. Okay, we're gonna put that does not do anything that I want it to do. And um, I was so much work to get it to do anything. Um, that when I finally do it, they have some agency over their body. They, they're like, oh, I can make things. Oh, that one there? Yeah. don't have like cause and effect over their body. So you might want to mute yourself. We're going to look for their event that they're um, wanting to look at. Oh, when's the next day? Because I'm going to just go with it. it um, so what you want to do is you want to model how to use the switch. You want to demonstrate how you're going to use it. And you want to choose a switch and location that you know will be successful. And this is um, from Karen Kangas. Yeah. A little bit more from Karen. Um, we yeah, want to yeah. presume competence. If there's a switch activation by the student, never assume that it was accidental. Just presume that it was on purpose and make that a teachable moment. So you could say like, oh, you touched the switch with your elbow and that made the blow dryer turn on or that made the animal inflate. That was so cool. Can you do it again? You know, and so you're using that, you're, you're teaching them um, and then something that you may think looks accidental may really, in the end, become intentional. All right. This is my friend JT here, and he has taught me so, so much. So let me explain his switch setup a little bit. This is a proximity switch. It is connected to a voice output switch that is sitting on this tray. Um that has all sorts of sassy yeses. So it has like, yep, yep, yes, that's the one. Totes, you know, something just crazy. This one is attached to the 
rail of his tray or the side of his tray and it's his elbow and it has sassy nose like no way not a not it try again um so that's kind of how what his setup um looks like currently um a little bit um we have the voice output switches on his um, tray because he does appear sometimes want to use his hand um, to activate those, but his head and his elbow, he's like super quick, super efficient, um, can just like pop, pop, pop off his answers um, right there. Um, so he's a student that came to us and he was coming in like one day a week and everybody was seeing him because he wasn't well enough to be at school after the pandemic. And we weren't sure if he could, how much he could see. He has CVI. We weren't sure if he had like a um, similar thing to CVI, but an auditory impairment. We weren't sure about that. Um, lots of medical conditions. And, you know, it's like, hey, let's try, you know, let's try these switches and see what we can do. And let's try some writing and let's try some reading. And, and the family's like, we don't think he can do it. They told us he'd never be able to do anything like that. Um, and you'll see a video in one of the sessions of him totally following a shared reading activity. The other thing that happened is in the classroom, his, he was hitting that no button. So he was a first grader last year, hitting that little no button over and over. And the teacher's like, I think it's in the wrong place. Cause I think he's just like hitting it. So she took it away. And this is a great classroom team that never does this. And so my AT partner comes in and she's like, hey, what happened to his switch that gives him his no nose? And they're like, oh, we think he was hitting it accidentally. And so, you know, he's sitting there, quiet body, not moving, periodically getting that yes button to some of her questions. And she's like, hey, we're going to put this back on and try it and see how it goes. So get it on there. And immediately he's like, boom, 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 boom. So typical first grader playing with language. You know, what do we like to say? Like when we first like to speak, no, 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 no. And it was just him, um, you know, being a typically developing, you know, first grader, just, oh, I'm going to just, I can say no, I can just say no over and over again. And, and that's going to be okay. So um, we really want to you know, presume competency. This is another one. We'll be talking about the alternative pencil again in another session. And he had an IEP goal to spell his name. So here we are in February and we're doing partner assisted scanning. Do you want an A? Do you want a B? Do you want a C? <coughs> and you can see he actually got, you know, some of the letters in his name. Um, and then when we go down here to May, he spelled it J-E-C-O-B. How many first graders don't quite get the spelling right for their names? So, you know, he definitely, and he was using his yes and no's to make choices, so either like head movements or his voice output switches, because we teach both. All right. So super exciting. So we talked about... So a lot of times what will happen, I'm going to share this little quote from Ian Bean, um, is that we'll provide a student with one switch site and only one or two activities that we talked about and wonder why there's a loss of motor skill. And in actuality, it has very little to do the that with the student. We've missed the boat because we haven't made the activity play-based and fun and have failed to build, <clears throat> build in repetition and variety. And I love this De Deborah Silverman quote here. It's like, wisdom shows up after the mistakes. So it's like, okay, we've been doing this this way. I've done it. You know, how can we change this up a little so it better meets the students' needs? All right. So how many of you have this pink pig? You can give me a thumbs up in the chat. I see Kara raised her hand. What happens with that pink pig, Kara? Someone says, I think we just got one. You know, a lot. I think it gets boring pretty fast. It does get boring pretty fast. Um, so, and then what do people say about the student? They can't do it. They're they, can't, 
Yeah, they can't do it. So we've chatted about some things you could do to make toys more exciting. Why don't you either unmute or pop in the chat something you could do to liven up this pink pig. He kind of walks and snorts and that's really about all he does. Um, so he might be exciting the first two, three times and then he's kind of boring. Um, you could add lights to the pink pig. You could do that, Molly. That's awesome. Um, costumes for the different holidays. That would add some variety. That would be really fun. Other things. Pair with a book. Yep. I've done that a lot where we do shared reading and it's like you could be reading a book about pigs and it'd be like, okay, um, we just heard the pig. Let's make the pig move. Um, go over different surfaces, pair with a piano. He could carry something. You guys are awesome. So he could carry something. He could push things over. Like kids love to like have peers build things up and then be able to knock them down. So it could be used during, you know, you know, playtime and or anytime they could be building a thing and um, um, knock it down. Someone we use piggy for painting. We do too. We use piggy painting as well. Um, oh, as well as a multimodal activity along with the read aloud pig parade is a terrible idea. I don't know what the read aloud pig parade is. Is that a book? Going to have to look it up. Um, yeah, we attach paintbrushes. Um, some of my older pigs, I just, I dip their paint, their um, feet in the paint and have them walk across. Um, if you believe it or if you can believe it or not, Edmonds does not own a pink pig. Um, so um, anyway, so he, it does not. So I have all sorts of other stuffed animals. So how do you use the piggy for painting, Molly? You can um, use industrial twist ties or packing tape or um, painter's tape, and you can just strap on a marker or a paintbrush. Um, you can have it pull items. Another way it could paint by pulling items is you could use those um, dog tag beads and attach it to dip it in paint and have a way to like a hook or something to attach it to his tail. And he could drag that across paper, um, cover the feet with the fingers of rubber gloves and dip in paint. Yep. I currently have a paint kitty and she um, looks like she, her job is a painter. Um, so great ideas, everyone. So now does the pink pig seem so boring? All right. So this is my favorite quote ever, and I think you should print it out and hang it on your wall. Um, it says, learning can only happen when a child is interested. If he's not interested, it's like throwing marshmallows at his head and calling it learning. Um, definitely been there with some of my students over the years. So, um, you know, figuring out how to shake it up a little bit has definitely changed my practice. Um, and I want to talk about this and it's a little bit controversial for some, but it's kind of really what, what I believe and what I've seen is here's a couple of IEP goals. So you want to be clear about the skill you're teaching. Are you teaching cause and effect? Or are you teaching agency? So let's read IEP goal one. The student will engage in a variety of cause and effect play for open, close, in, out, on, off to improve eye-hand coordination, motor planning, and bilateral coordination skills independently from zero out of three tiles, trials to two out of three. It's not a bad goal. Um, but look at if we change it just a little bit. When engaged in a motivating and meaningful activity, the student will demonstrate agency by independently activating a switch with their head to make something happen from zero out of three trials to two out of three trials in a 10 minute activity. If this were your child, which would you rather have be the goal? The second. So the second we're looking at the student's potential. Um, 
Agency Molly means something very similar to cause and effect. It's it's the ability to make something happen, that you have the power to make something happen. Um, it just is a much more respectful way to refer to our students when they're learning a new skill because they have cause and effect. They're taking that ability to make things happen and they're using it to have agency to do really hard things. Um, does that make sense? So um, every child has, you know, like we've talked about before, the ability to connect, learn, and understand. They have that cause and effect piece. So we're going to, again, give them the agency to use their body um, to make something magical happen. All right. Next soapbox. You ready? Um, hand over hand prompting. I've used it. Sometimes I have to stop myself from using it still today. Um, there's research from the 1960s that says this is not effective in teaching a skill. Um, might be called full physical prompt. It depends on kind of how your district or the person you're working with refers to it. What it teaches a student is to be passive. I don't need to do anything. And it also violates their body autonomy. Um, it does not teach the motor plan needed to do the action because the student can check out and you're going to do it for them. Um, so I used to say, if I've got a student and I'm working on writing and, you know, I want them to write an A, they're going to learn much more by putting one mark on the paper than if I take their hand and make an A because the motor plan has gone through like, oh, when I put the pencil on the paper, I move my arm and something happens. But if I just move their arm, nothing happens. Um, it's not evidence-based practice for learning AAC skills, switch use, really any skill. There's no evidence that shows it works. Um, it can cause students to reject AAC, switch activities, academic activities. Um, so we really want to try to work with our teams to stop this from happening in the classroom as much as possible. Totally, it would be my my dream. And there are times when you have to put your hand on the child to do something, but very rare. And when you do, you should be asking the child permission. Can I, you know, I want to help you do this. Can I put my hand on your hand to help so we can do it together? Um, so you want, yeah, and really what I, the whole part about violating body autonomy, I don't want my students to know or learn that it is okay for anybody to touch me whenever they want or how they want. Um, so really start teaching, you know, your teams to be like, no, we're, we can do hop on top. That's more respectful. And there's some motor plans firing that way. And we can, um, you know, ask them for permission to touch their body. So how many of you have seen the tree? I haven't seen it in person. I'm going to make a trip out there soon. Um, but the tree of life is on the Oregon coast. And um, I really think this, you know, believe and never give up. So your first try at switch access, it doesn't happen. That's okay. You know, so you want to believe and never give up. All right. So, oh my word, I don't know what is going on with these videos. Okay. Quickly, we're going to go through some switches. Um and then let's see how we're doing here. Oh, we're good. So these are mechanical switches. So they plug into something. They don't require a battery. Um, and things you may have seen are jelly bean switches, which is a little um, kind of a medium sized button switch. And then you have a big switch, which is like so. And then down here, the spec switch is about the size of a quarter. Um, this little one is a micro light. You barely have to touch it to make it move. This is a thumb switch. This is a finger isolation switch. Um, this one will connect to things by USB. This is both elevated and a texture switch. So that's what those are. Um, when you're looking around your AT closet or in your classrooms, you can see what you can come up with. Um, two different types of pillow switches. So it's a padded switch that 
has like a pillow around it. And once they put any pressure on it, it will activate it. Plate switch, that's great to kind of tape on a table, put under a book. Um, a plate switch with some elevation. There's grip switches, pinch switches, other grip switches. Um, these are proximity switches. And so what they do is they don't require the student to touch the switch. So they just have to get close. And some of them you can set the distance for how close they get. So they just have to get close and then they'll activate it. Um, what I find with the proximity switches is the mechanical switches that we saw in the first slide. Um, if you've got someone with dystonia, you're gonna get this wind up and hit for the mechanical switches. Um, for the proximity switches, a lot of times you get a much smoother movement because they don't have to hit anything. They don't have to make contact with it. Um, <coughs> um, these are some different joysticks and switches. There's like a very little pressure one, um, blue line, uh, the pointed. We have a lot of a lot of all of these switches we have in the Setsi Lending Library. Um, so just a variety of different types of joysticks. I'm going to switch this one till we get to the end. Um, these are rollerball mice. Um, these are different specialty switches. The ultimate switch is one of my favorite. It has this little ball on the end and you just need to make contact it with it in any direction and it will um, activate the switch activity. Same kind of thing for the wobble switch. There's fiber optic switches where you break the fiber optic light and it makes things happen. Um, this one senses movement um, and this is a sip and puff switch. So, and then this is, we'll be learning a lot more about this. This is a power link um, by AbleNet and the Praetorian also has an eye click, which is um, very similar. There's some links here on how to use both of those. Um, so based on all the things that we saw, um, are there any of those that you've, you've used? Yep, Valerie, I love your ideas. Um, these are things, again, just so you know what they look like and you have a slide deck that shows what they look like. These are um, switch interfaces. And so they allow you to connect switches to computers, iPads, Chromebooks, um, phones, all sorts of different things. These are the ones before are wired. Um, these are um, Bluetooth here. The ones before are wired, except for the Bluetooth. It's on the wrong slide. It is um, not wired. Um, anybody used any of those? All right, lots of great things. All right, determining switch access. So here's where you get to become a detective. You're gonna use your clinical observation skills to carefully look at your student and see where they move. And then you're gonna teach and shape that movement. Um, Michelle's got the Bluetooth and the hook with the John Johnson switch interface, one of my faves. Um, so things to consider when you're observing movement. Um, so my OT friends out there, the most efficient access site is often not the hand. But yeah, we all go there first. Um, so it's great to kind of work on lots of different switch access sites. So if they've got some hand entrance interests, like if they're, you know, when you're looking at like a power chair that we're using, um, head array to access, they're going to have right, left, back of their head to access it, but we need to be able to change from drive to talk mode. So the hand is perfect for one of those or different spots, but you want to look for the movement. Um, that allows the most engagement with the activity, um, the lowest cognitive load to execute, and the least amount of motor planning and accuracy to execute. And I often go for the head because um, head control develops first and you can do a very little movement to, to get that and not a lot of motor planning. And then looking at how they need to be positioned is really important. So we talked about my friend JT's sites. This is my friend, um, Sharina. She uses her nose on this one. This looks way further back than it really is. Um, this is a proximity switch she uses for her head. Works beautifully. Sometimes she uses her tongue on this one. Um, 
And then Kara says, head control also frees up their hands for other things. Yes. Um, this is my friend Drew. She's got one on her foot plate. She also has another one behind her elbow. Um, and then she has her head array up here. Here's um, another, you know, each side of the head. Um, another head switch. She has two. And she's so funny. She like uses them to scan her AAC device. And so I said, can I take a video of you using your switch? And we were just tr trying this side out with her. And she's like, which one? <laughs> she asked me. Um, it's the one with the scissors connected. Um, this little guy, he, I did a consult with him and I'm going to show this video and I bet my sound is not going to share since I had to get back on. Ooh, um, he's he's like using his knee it. above his knee and then a switch on his at his head to activate his switches and he's cruising through his communication device doing um step scanning. So um pretty cool there. All right. Again, looking at when you're using switches, looking at the universal design for learning framework. So engagement, representation, and expression, making sure you include all of those things in your switch activities. And then I've got a list of do's and don'ts when teaching switch skills. I'm going to let you um, look through those on your own. Um, and then there's a great article here from Karen Kangas about um, seating to increase access to AT. Um, the one I want to focus on here is give quiet, attentive wait time. So what happens is we've got a student, we've got an activity, we're excited. And we say, okay, let's make the pig knock over the blocks. You can touch the switch to make this happen. And then you wait and you don't say anything. Because the minute you say something, that motor plan has to start over. I had one little boy that it was 50 seconds. And so he'd start to lift his head and somebody would say something and the head would go down and he'd have to start that motor plan um, all over. Um, oops. And then here are some don'ts. We talked about um, some of these we've talked about in the presentation. There's um, and then I have an article that was in, I have two articles that were in Closing the Gap. So you can look through this one. Um, I'll share another, the next one next time. And it's just a way to do some fun, engaging activities in the classroom. Um, and then remember, practice makes myelin and myelin makes perfect. Thank you for joining me today.